Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training, enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. All right, so today we're talking about remote collar facts and fiction. There's a lot of facts and a lot of fiction about remote collars floating around the space out there. And so we're here to clarify some of that today here on Canine Revolution Radio. All right, so let's jump right into this. All right, there are a lot of myths. There's a lot of improper details surrounding remote collar systems. Uh, A lot of people refer to remote collars incorrectly. Some people call them e-collars, electronic collars, shock collars, zap collars, blast collars, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I don't prefer or we don't prefer any of that terminology because I think it gives the wrong mindset towards a remote collar system. It gives the wrong, uh, you know, mindset towards what could be a really good training tool if it's used properly, which we'll be talking about today. Um, but the remote collar systems that we're going to be discussing about today, the ones that we use, they do not shock, they do not zap, you know, we're going to go through some of the common myths and we're going to provide some of the facts about them as well. So that's what we're starting off with. All right, Kevin, you got something you want to say. I can tell. <laughs> Why? Cause I'm leaning forward to yeah, just you, so you pick me up. You, you got something you want to say. No, no, you it's just, say. you know, that's just mislabeled, you know. It doesn't just give the wrong idea. It just yeah. completely makes it something that it's not. But no, mindset uh-uh. is a big thing. Just like you know, yeah. anybody that's that's been involved at the revolution, do not call a kennel a cage around me. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> Kevin? Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yeah, I remember Kevin that. Used to call him cage. Now I get pissed when people say cage. I'm like, what are you <laughs> talking about? <laughs> do not call a kennel a cage. It gives it the wrong mindset, the wrong mentality when we're talking about a piece of training equipment, a piece of training tool. You know what I'm saying? So terminology is huge. And if you've ever been here at the Revolution or worked with us at all, you know we're all about that terminology, right? That he is. <laughs> all right. So, in order to overall understand remote collars, first we need to understand the principles that remote collars operate on, what their purpose is for training, and maintenance of behaviors, right? So, a remote collar can help us accomplish that, but we have to be doing it and using it properly, all right? Uh, really basically the way that a remote collar system operates is with a remote control, which is technically called the transmitter and the collar that the dog wears, which is technically called the receiver. So the way it works is a radio signal is sent from the remote to the collar. When one of the buttons is depressed, that results in the delivery of a stimulus to the dog. Okay. The stimulus is similar to the sensation that a human being receives from a TENS unit. Or, you know, another example could be one of the ab toning belts. You guys ever seen those commercials? Is that what those are? Used one? Yeah. Does it work? No, I don't know. I've never sure. tried one. <laughs> <laughs> but Just go get a couple remote collars. We'll just strap them on. <laughs> I've <laughs> talked to a couple people. <laughs> I've talked to a couple people that have put them on. They say it's pretty, pretty incredible, you yeah. know. But uh, well, yeah, you basically put this belt on, and it's got, like, the the contacts in there, mm-hmm. and it just contracts your muscle. Oh, you yeah. Know what I'm saying? It'd be uncomfortable. So, uh, you know, the sensation of a remote collar can be unpleasant, you know, just like a TENS unit or an ab toner, but it's not going to cause any harm, you know what I'm saying? So that's the basics on how it works. Did you guys want to add anything before we keep going here? No, that's no. good. Yeah. All, right. <clears throat> All right, so a remote collar can be extremely useful if properly conditioned and trained. <gasps> Again, a remote collar system can be useful if properly conditioned and properly trained and we're going to go more into detail on some of those here in a little bit all right but a remote collar system can help us clearly communicate with our dog off leash at a distance and in a variety of scenarios okay so think about it as a invisible leash all right it can be used a remote collar can be used to reinforce or correct behavior depending on the application how you're using it and the handler's understanding of learning theory in addition to their timing of the usage of the remote collar system. So again, there's two components here. Number one, we have to be using a remote collar properly. We have to condition it properly. We have to understand the tool, right? We have to be applying the tool very properly. And that also comes down to the handler, the trainer, the owner, whoever's using it, 
their understanding of learning theory, canine learning theory, how do dogs learn things, how do they operate, how do they think, in addition to their timing, you know what I'm saying? Because even a, even a, a, a using the timing incorrectly can make it, a, you know, not a fair situation for the dog depending on what's going on. You know what I'm saying? So as an owner, as a handler, as a trainer, I have to have a very detailed understanding of learning theory. I also have to have an understanding of how to operate the remote collar system. You know what I'm saying? Mm -mm. And that's what we do, obviously. When we're working with people, we're teaching them, training them, coaching them on how to use this tool properly with their dog. You know what I'm saying? And every situation is different. You know, sometimes you may not be using it. Sometimes you may be using it. Sometimes you may be using different features, but every situation is different. You know what I'm saying? And you have to, your knowledge of your dog and learning theory and how the dog operates in addition to that tool is what's going to make everything as successful as possible. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Got anything? Yeah, I mean, along with that, just clear communication system as well. It's huge, you know, for yeah. remote collar application. Obviously, you'll you'll achieve that going through, you know, most most training uh, methods. Uh, but that's huge along with the timing, like you said, just because dogs very much so live in the moment. You know, if your dog, you know, defecates on the floor and you discover it 30 minutes later, you can't just bring the dog out, point at it, and then start delivering that stimulation. It's not going right. to – you're not doing anything at that point. So right. there's a lot of do's and don'ts, which I'm sure we're going to – going to talk about but for the average joe you know hmm. probably want to go through a professional to get this properly conditioned to your dog so that you don't build upon uh any bad behaviors mm -hmm. existing insecurity anxieties things like that yeah yeah and we and want to be fair too you know? yeah absolutely. yeah absolutely and and to to further dive into that a little bit like this is why it's fair like you mentioned earlier it's unpleasant but it doesn't cause harm yes it's unpleasant but we, as long as you do these steps the process that we do it's fair so yes there is an unpleasant stimulation but the dog understands what it is and how to make it go away and that has to be in place and if it's not then you could be making things a lot worse mm -hmm. so yep and uh you can get really detailed you know with the way that you're using a remote collar you know you can uh there's a whole lot of variety of things you can you can condition it different ways mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and we won't go into all those details but you know uh <clears throat> can be very very useful if used yeah. properly you know uh, but a lot of times remote collars get a bad name you know what i'm saying and uh, just like any training tool they can be misused you know i've seen people misuse kennels mm -hmm. i've seen people misuse back ties i've seen people misuse leashes regular collars flat collars mm -hmm. You know, there was a dog that I trained a long time ago. This dog had a freaking flat collar that its skin was growing around. It was so tight and you know, left on its neck for so long, you know what I'm saying? Not giving baths, none of that kind of stuff, you know? So there's a, all, everything that we're doing, even as a human, that we're using with our dog or we're using with ourselves or other humans, can be misused. Mm -hmm. um, and remote collars are no exception, you know what I'm saying? So the goal today is that we're going to discuss some of the most common myths that surround the remote collar and then provide the details uh, to our process of using a remote collar system, some of the prerequisites, you know, some of the ways we like to use that stuff, all right? Um, but myth number one, all right, here we go. A remote collar will hurt my dog. That's the myth. All right, we already talked really briefly, uh, but a quality remote collar system is not designed to cause pain or to hurt a dog. Okay, the remote collar operates in the same way that a TENS unit or an ab toner belt does. However, the stimulus provided by the remote collar is actually far less intense than that of a TENS unit or an ab toner belt. Okay, so think about it, TENS unit. Usually these are used at like a chiropractor office or like physical therapy office. You can get them on Amazon. I have one at the house that I use uh, for my shoulders and stuff like that to increase blood flow into the muscle, mm -hmm. right? Um, ab toner <coughs> belt, same thing, provides stimulation. You can get that on Amazon, you know, if you're into ab belts. But anyway, uh, <coughs> so the stimulation on those is usually going to be more intense than the stimulation provided by a remote collar. And on all three, I don't know about the ab toner for sure, but I'm pretty sure uh, that you can change the intensity. You okay. know, so it can be mm -hmm. more intense if you want it to be, less intense, right? Um, so anyway, uh, you can do the same thing with a remote collar. You know what I'm saying? But the main thing is, as we'll get into with the remote collar, you always want to operate using the lowest but most effective level, stimulation level for that situation for that dog. 
which is going to change depending on what's going on around you, the situation, the scenarios, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the uh, stimulus is going to be less intense than you're going to experience in a TENS unit or an ab toner belt. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Uh, let's see. The remote collar, uh, like we just said, will need to be intensified or reduced in intensity as needed depending on the individual dog, the individual situation, the individual scenario that you may be facing. Uh, there, there could be distractions present where we need to increase our stimulation level. That's fine. Once we depart from that scenario, we need to decrease the stimulation level so we continue to operate with the most effective stimulation level for the scenario and the environment we are in, which does not mean overstimulation, right? Does not mean understimulation. The stimulation level has to change that dog's behavior from the misbehavior to the correct behavior. You know what I'm saying? And again, this is assuming that the dog's been through the remote collar prerequisites, remote collar conditioning process, remote collar application process before we even start using it out at distraction places or things like that. You know what I'm saying? All right. Uh, you know, back in the day, the first days of the remote collar, there were collar systems that were super intense. You know, actually, <clears throat> before remote collars were even invented or used, the way the, you know, a lot of it goes back to like hunting days with hunting dogs, but you know, the guys needed to control the dog from a distance. So the way they would do that was with a BB gun. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They just shoot the dog with a BB gun. It's not going to kill the dog. It causes a little bit of pain there. You know, yeah. they might get some BBs stuck in them, but they needed to control the dog from a distance. So they would use a BB gun. Then they created the remote collar. You know, at first the collar levels could not be changed. So it was just a super intense level all the time. And, you know, there was probably some, you know, shocking oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> involved, you know taser, what I'm saying? Taser action. <laughs> Could be a yeah. taser action, cattle prod action. But through the years, especially where we're at today with remote collars, the quality and just the level of the uh, the product is, is yeah. great, you know what I'm saying, if you're getting a quality collar. There's a lot of uh, not quality remote BS collar systems there. that yeah. I would not recommend, <laughs> you know. But the quality remote collar systems that we have today – have an enormous range of stimulation levels that can be fine-tuned to the dog at hand. You know, so like the collars we use generally have levels 0 through 127. You know, as a human, I can't even feel like levels 0 through 15 or level mm -hmm. 0 through 20, depending on what's going on. Some dogs feel level 1. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that just tells you like how finely tuned you can uh, precision in these uh, stimulation levels if you need to. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. one thing I do to uh, to like make my clients more comfortable. Yeah. And I'm the same way. I'm not going to apply anything mm -hmm. to my dog that I'm not going to you know feel myself. Bingo. Right? Because it's just not fair. So usually during the return or you know I'm talking to them even the consultation, yeah. I can have them feel that stimulation so that one they understand what exactly it is yeah. that it does not hurt. But two, uh, most oftentimes the the working level that their dog is usually on their baseline stimulation level yeah. they can't even feel. Yeah. Which makes them feel a lot better. Oh, yeah. You get up to you know, 25, 30, 35 on some people and they're like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, there it is. It's like, well, your dog's on ten. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so absolutely. <laughs> it makes them a little more comfortable with it. Yep, and that's a quality system too. Yeah. You know, there's still a lot of system, systems out there that do not have a large range of stimulation. They have very distinct differences between the levels. So, like, let's say level one to two with the systems that we use, you can't even, you, right. can, you barely can even tell a difference. Negligible. It, that way, you can fine tune it with like a cheaper system or a not so good system. You know, levels one to two might have a drastic yeah. increase in stimulation not good yeah. you know it's not going to allow you to fine tune it yeah if your remote caller has 10 levels and that's it yeah, um probably there's probably good. a huge difference between and a lightning signal on the right. button <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, let's, let's just go and get rid of that one yeah. yeah so the key here is you know you want to be able to fine tune your remote caller system if you're using a cheaper remote caller model that's not going to be the case so don't go on amazon and buy the, the ten dollar yeah. or the thirty dollar remote caller you know battery operated yep. Yeah, so when that battery's fresh, that's a, it's still a pretty stiff stimulation. Yeah. yeah. The ones that we're using, you know, they're generally, you know, 260 plus. You know, yeah. that's what that's what they cost. Rechargeable, lasts forever, though. Yeah. And there's a lot of good brands out there you could select. You know, we'll get more into the ones that we use later. But uh, just make sure you're using a quality remote collar system with a wide range of levels. But uh, even in that case, you still have to go through remote collar prerequisites, yeah. conditioning, and application phases before you start using it. You know what I'm saying? But all right, so that's myth number one. <clears throat> a remote collar will hurt my dog. Not true. You know what I'm saying? The remote collar is not going to hurt your dog. Okay? 
Myth number two, the remote collar will burn my dog's neck. You know, I've heard this before. It's a common thing, Mm -hmm. you know, floating around the Internet about remote collars. Uh, But real quick, the remote collar will not burn your dog's neck. The amount of voltage and amperage that a remote collar emits is so low that it is incapable of burning the neck. You know what I'm saying? It's not even possible Mm -hmm. for it to do so. But a lot of people get confused thinking that their dog's neck is being burnt burnt when actually they are improperly applying or improperly using a remote collar um, and doing so can cause some irritation uh, to the dog's neck you know what i'm saying it's not the dog's uh, neck getting burnt or the skin getting burnt right it's improper application improper fitment yep. improper usage that's going to cause some issues you know some of these irritations could be scabbing <clears throat> small cuts and scrapes you know stuff like that you know, a lot, you know, uh, some people leave their remote collars on too long. Some le- put them on too loose. Some put them on too tight. Yep. Sometimes the contact points are the, aren't the right kind of contact points. So there's a lot of different details that go into, you know, putting on a remote collar properly, fitting it properly, making sure it's applied properly. And sometimes it takes a professional's help to figure out the best combination for your dog. The contact points, the, the collar you know, that fits the co- the, the remote collar uh, box, you know what I'm saying, so so far and so forth, you know what I'm saying. But uh, the scabbing, the small scrapes, the cuts to the neck, these types of irritations uh, are usually the cause of necrosis, which is uh, lack of blood flow uh, to the tissue, which results in a degradation of the skin tissue there, you know what I'm saying. It can happen to humans and dogs or any other mammal, you know, if you got a wristband on too tight, mm-hmm. you know, you're restricting the blood flow, your skin's going to start to uh, thin there, you know what I'm saying, which could make it easier for irritations to happen, you know. So with the remote collar system, the collar, the way that necrosis happens or these irritations happen, the collar is either too tight to the dog's neck for too long, right? This causes a lack of blood flow to the area where the contact points are touching the neck. <clears throat> so again... Extremely important. Follow proper protocols. Ensure the remote collar is properly fitted to the dog's neck and that it is repositioned properly as needed. Right? So our protocols are, you know, at least when dogs are here for training, you know, and they're using the remote collar, which typically is not going to be for the first, uh, you know, seven to ten days that they're here. They won't even see a remote collar. Uh, But once we start using one with them, you know, the mornings, the remote collar is going on the left side of the neck. Mm-hmm. You know, take it off for the lunch break time. Then the afternoons, it's going to be on the right side of the neck. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're rotating it, you know, multiple times a day to prevent that necrosis, you know, to prevent any types of irritations. Also, don't leave it on all night. Yeah. You know, if you're leaving the house for an extended period of time, don't leave it on. You know what I'm saying? Take it off. So uh, if you follow the proper remote collar system protocols, you can minimize the risk of skin irritations. And we go through that with everybody that we work with, you know, we give them the, the the handbook and the layout, you know, to, to achieve maximum success and minimizing risk of irritations. You know what I'm saying? Another reason why irritation could occur is if the remote collar is too loose, you know what I'm saying? So we just talked about one that's too tight. Now we're talking about one that's too loose, It's rubbing, right? It's rubbing all the time. It's moving around excessively. This can cause irritation to the neck. Imagine, that's why I don't like, you know, necklaces or stuff like that. I don't like all that rubbing and stuff, you know. Um, Of course, if I decide to wear necklaces or if it was something I needed to do, I can be desensitized to it. You know, and that's what we do as part of the remote color process. But, you know, just just imagine something just rubbing you all the time. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of what's going on. So some dogs also, in another sense, some dogs have uh, sensitive skin. You know, they may be allergic to the materials used by the collar or the contact points. So, again, good to have uh, expert help, professional help to help figure out what those allergies are and to change out the contact points as needed. You know what I'm saying? So you're going to need to make sure you're using the proper contact points for your particular dog. And those are going to be based on your dog's skin, their allergies, and your dog's coat. You know, Mm -hmm. a thick-coated dog like a husky is not going to (laughs) need the same contact points that a pit bull is going to need. Shave the neck. Yeah, you could shave the neck. You could shave the neck. (laughs) I don't don't need to, but it does make it a lot easier. (laughs) Yeah. So, 
there's a ton of contact points out there that you can get that you can use you know you want to consult with an expert you could talk to a, a professional trainer that uses them you could talk to your remote collar system manufacturer you know to get the best contact points for your specific dog but of course if you guys have a question on this just let us know reach out to us um, but in general you're going to have uh, several options for contact points. You're going to have what we call standard contact points, which are the ones that come with the remote collar. You're going to have uh, like a medium contact point, which is like a three-quarter inch contact point that could be used for, uh, you know, dogs that aren't quite husky status, but a little bit German less, shepherds. like German shepherds. Yeah, German shepherds are common. Uh, you're going to have extended contact points. These are like <coughs> an inch or over an inch uh, in length. That's for your, like your huskies, you know what I'm saying? You can have short contact points or a comfort adapter, which would be like for your pit bulls, Dobermans, uh, you know, some Rottweilers. It just depends. You know, that's going to be a shorter fur dog. You could also have uh, what we call feather contact points, which are even better for long, thick-coated dogs. It's basically two, two springs that uh, have some movement in them, but they can get through the hair really easily. So, you know, bottom line, there's a ton of options, so you just got to figure out which is best for your dog. So that is going to require some expert help in, uh, in finding that, you know. But again, going back to the original myth here <clears throat> that the remote collar is burning dog's neck, that's not happening. You know, it literally cannot happen with a remote collar. But, you know, you could get irritations if you're using this pro improperly. So you want to make sure that uh, you follow proper protocols. You got proper uh, contact points, proper fitment so that you can minimize the risk of the skin irritations, right? Do you guys have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, if you want to see what this looks like, just go to Amazon and look up any of these remote collars and look at the reviews. And uh, people post pictures all the time, and they'll oh, this this collar burned my dog's neck, and you can see it clears day. It's not a burn. It's right. from exactly what you're talking about. Right. And you know, the bottom line, get professional help. Like right. if you're going to get into remote collars, you don't know what you're doing with dog training or all, any of that stuff get professional help um this this can cause some serious issues if you're not doing it right yeah yeah so. never the stimulation although yeah. you know i think us as humans you know we make that connection because oh it's electronic this is what mm -hmm. it's doing blah, blah blah but it's never the stimulation that you're putting it on mm -hmm. yeah also those new contact points are like really good like those, the feather ones yeah, yeah. The feather yeah. Ones yeah. Nice for the long-haired dogs but yeah i mean you just hit the nail on the head with that if you're getting into the world of remote collars if you're even considering you know remote collars or looking into them you need expert help don't yeah. try to do it yourself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All right. And that will bring us into our third myth of the day. Last myth of the day, which is going to be uh, remote collars can cause fear and or aggression. <coughs> myth number three. Uh, so, like we already talked about, a remote collar, just like any other training tool by itself, will not cause fear and or aggression from a dog. However, <coughs> if the training tool is used improperly, or the trainer, or the handler, or the owner does not know how to properly teach and build proper behaviors. They don't know how to rehabilitate, truly rehabilitate behaviors by peeling away that onion, right? Just waiting for it. There could be. <laughs> got to bring the onion. <laughs> he could, I think he missed it in the last he might one. might have. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. You got no it in way. there? I don't know. He Maybe slid it in there. It. We're going to have to reshoot it. But, uh... <laughs> If, if the person that's working with the dog in remote collar does not know how to truly build proper behavior, truly rehabilitate behavior, there could be unwanted effects, you know. Mainly, what this comes down to is, is the remote collar being used properly in a clear way to the dog? Does the trainer or the handler or the owner really understand and know what they are doing? You know, I've seen too many times where the dog owner decides to purchase a remote collar put it on the dog start randomly using it you know mm -hmm. i'm not going to say any names because then they sent their dog we we uh, <laughs> were able to rehabilitate away. that issue technically i was guilty of that before i became a trainer oh that's yeah. right yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know but then you can you you know with us we've dealt with this a ton of times mm -hmm. people doing that and we were we can rehabilitate it you know what i'm saying but it does take time got to stick to the process sorry you know Lulu. What I'm saying? well while you're on that uh you know 
we've heard of stories of actual trainers doing that. Yeah, yeah. You know, day yeah. one putting remote collars on. Mm-hmm. So even when we were talking about like seek professional help, these are probably questions. Yeah. If you are uh, interviewing trainers to help you out, these are probably questions you should be asking about. Right. You know, what's tell me about your methodology with the remote collars, how to use it, when do you introduce it, all those kind of things. Absolutely, that's a great point. Just you come know. to us. Just come yeah. to the revolution. Eight four three two one three two six seven six. Doesn't matter where you're at. <laughs> yeah. You know. Uh, you know, like you just said, trainers, you know, some trainers, this is the first step of their training process. Yeah. Day one, yeah. hour one, minute number one with the dog. Let me put this remote collar on. All right, now we're starting to use it. Like I already said, for us, we don't believe in that. Mm-hmm. We got to build up a foundation first. For most dogs that go through training with us, they won't even see a remote collar till day seven to 10 of training, mm-hmm. you know, because we have to take that time to build up the foundational pieces. You know what I'm saying? We have to establish a relationship. We have to build up a training foundation, you know, then and only then can we begin to lay a remote collar conditioning on top of the foundation, right? Because following that process alleviates any misunderstanding on the part of the dog, makes the remote collar system very clear for the dog to understand on top of your verbal or silent communication system as well. You know what I'm saying? And then you can get even more detailed with it later if you're doing specialty work or anything like that. And again, let's say we do a uh, remote collar conditioning for like our standard advanced training program, off leash training program. You know what I'm saying? There's a conditioning process for that. Now, if I'm going to start using the remote collar in other ways for specialty type work, there's more conditioning process to that to teach the dog in the context of this scenario, this is what it means, this is mm-hmm. what that means. You know what I'm saying? But because you have that foundation built in the uh, advanced training program conditioning Mm -hmm. and application at the advanced training program you're already set up for big success by the time you get to specialty training you know what i'm saying all right so that's the third myth we're going to cover right those are the three myths we're going to cover today but bottom line just like with any other training tool if you use it properly it can be a great asset to your training a great uh you know tool to having your training toolkit if you use it improperly it can have drastic unwanted side effects you know so real quick what i like to do is i just like to talk through our training progression and our remote collar conditioning process this is uh not detailed you know what i'm saying we're going to briefly overview this and then we'll go into more details uh in the future if you guys have questions just reach out to us so what we do is we operate in a rewards-based balanced training system. What this means is that we're going to start out our training uh, with our goal is to build a relationship with the dog using engagement and focus building activities. And then we'll slowly begin to implement accountability uh, after we work and, you know, we'll work on precise levels of obedience, implement accountability, socialization, distraction work. So let's kind of talk through it really briefly. Okay. So at the beginning of training, we're going to start using rewards to condition the dog that we, as the trainer, have value to them, right? So you come out to a training area, and we start to become the most interesting thing to you because hanging out with me is fun. Hanging out with me gives you, you know, good things that you like, like Chris and his donuts. I think I gave a couple to the dogs. What? (laughs) What? (laughs) You know, so you start coming out to your training areas. Having a good time with us, getting some uh, training rewards, good to go, right? Now we establish value to the dog. Once the relationship has been established, we can begin to teach obedience work. For this, most of the time, we're going to be using food lures to show the dog. How do you say that, Kevin? Lure. 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 Food lures. Lure. Food lures. We are in South Carolina, just yeah. so you all know. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be using food lures, lures to show the dog how to move their body into different obedience positions. Uh, before we start assigning obedience commands to the various positions, and we're going to use classical conditioning for that. If that just went over your head, go ahead and uh, sign up now. Don't use, <laughs> don't, do don't, don't start you. with a remote collar. <laughs> yeah. Don't sign up with a remote collar. So again, we're using food lures to show the dog how to move their body into different obedience positions before we assign obedience commands to the various positions using classical conditioning. If that went over your head, sign up now. <laughs> Give us a call. <laughs> Once the dog is comfortable with the obedience and the commands have been conditioned, meaning we've done enough repetitions. How many repetitions? As many as it takes. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Enough repetitions. A lot of repetitions. (laughs) 
down, good, down, good, <laughs> down, good, down, good. We're trying to get in your good, sleep. Down, good. We should do a, we should do like a video <laughs> or like dancing down, good, down, good. <laughs> sit, yes, sit, yes. <laughs> now recall. <laughs> <laughs> Once the dog is comfortable with oh, the God. obedience and the commands have been conditioned. When we say down, they immediately go down. They don't need a lure anymore, for example. Lure. 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 <laughs> then we will layer into accountability, and we're going to start that with leash corrections. What that means, we ask the dog to down, for example. They don't down. We know they know how to down because we've been through the whole process up to this point. So we say no, and we give a quick tug on the leash, right? Leash correction. At that point, the dog's like, oops, they lay down. <laughs> Good. We reward them. You know what I'm saying? So that's the first step to accountability. Notice we have not started talking about uh, remote collars yet. Okay. So once the dog is comfortable with all obedience, with leash corrections, then we begin our remote collar conditioning. Again, typically everything up to this point is going to take seven to 10 days of training before we even start the remote collar conditioning piece. Sometimes it could be a little bit longer or shorter depending on the dog, right? Once we start remote collar conditioning, the first step for us is just to have the dog simply wear the collar for about one to two days in their day in, day out activities. They're still doing their walks, they're still doing their training uh, sessions, but now they're just wearing a, a new collar. Nothing's happening with the collar, it's just being worn, right? Because usually the remote collar is going to be fitted a little bit tighter than a normal collar, right? Uh, uh, so they have to be desensitized to that. There's going to be some extra weight from the remote collar. They have to be desensitized to that. So we just want them to forget that the collar is even there, you know. So like similar to us wearing a watch, after a few days of constantly wearing it, you forget that it's there. Or it feels like it is there even when it's off. Mm -hmm. We want that same effect with the remote collar. It's like the string. Absolutely. I take it off. I'm like, ah, I can still feel it. It's so weird. Once the initial uh, desensitization is complete, we are going to determine the lowest level that the dog can detect from the remote collar and use that level for our conditioning process. The dog can barely detect this level, right? We just barely want them to feel any sensation, right? Once we figure out that level, we're going to uh, start the conditioning process. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to classically condition the sensation of the remote collar to all the obedience behaviors, and then we're going to follow that with a reward, right? So we start this with the recall, then we go to the sit, the down, the heel behaviors to ensure that each step is extremely clear to the dog and they understand exactly what the sensation of the remote collar is communicating to them. And the conditioning process itself could take between one to three days, you know, sometimes shorter. Then we're going to start to apply the remote collar to all aspects of training, but especially for distance and off-leash work to ensure the safety and well-being of the dog. And that's the bottom line, why remote collars are so useful, because it helps us to ensure our dog's safety and their well-being in every situation, every scenario. You know what I'm saying? So again, if that process just went over your head, go ahead. Give us a call. Good to go. <laughs> yeah, it makes it sound easy, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot to it. Yeah. Well, another another thing with the remote collars, um, you know, they are effective tools, like we've been saying. So, like, you may you may you may be perfectly fine going through life doing leash corrections, but you know, what if what if you've got a medical condition? You know, what if you're a little bit older? Mm -hmm. You know, and you don't have physical strength to correct a dog. You got a big dog, mm -hmm. right? This is where. This is going to be very beneficial to you and, and, and help you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you need need professional help for sure. Mm -hmm. Make sure you And, uh, right. you know, if you're listening to this, you have little experience with the remote collar or little experience with this conditioning process, you know, just learning this as a trainer here takes a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You need that uh, help from the other trainers more experienced to help you know what you're looking for know what you're doing properly because there's a lot going on. You got a leash in your hands. Mm -hmm. You got a remote in your hands. You got food rewards, you know. You got an individual dog with different personalities individual that changes, dog. you know, dog yep. to dog. Yep, so. absolutely. So there's a lot of moving pieces 
to this conditioning process and getting it right is critical. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Some are more like okay with it. Others, you know, are not. You, know, yep. you got to approach each one differently. Yep. And Patience you, is key. You know? Right. If you rush through it, you're not setting that dog up for success. And yeah. you're just going to have to go back and redo it. You're yeah. Have to go back <laughs> and, and take longer. Yeah. <laughs> you have to take longer because now you got to recondition it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So bottom line, remote collars are often a misunderstood training tool. Obviously, you know, it's a heated d- debate, heated topic no matter where you go. Um, however, if you use them properly, they can be a great way to communicate with your dog clearly and ensure your dog's safety, especially when you have them off leash or at a distance from you. Just wanted to make it clear again, we do not recommend getting a remote collar system and just putting it on your dog and start using it. We also don't recommend having a remote collar as the first step in a training process or training progression. So like Chris already said, if you're talking to trainers and you're browsing around, you know, ask them, how are they using a remote collar? What's the methodology? You know, how are they, how are they conditioning? You know, or if they're, if you're doing a consultation and the first thing you do is put a remote collar, walk out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Get out of there. Absolutely. And if they're not able to clearly communicate and effectively communicate to you, could you imagine them not being able to co- clearly and effectively communicate with your dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah I mean, because, you know, right, if they slap it on day one, that already tells you right there they don't care about the bond, yeah. you know, and anything like that. They're trying to rush it. That's going to create a negative association with the handler. Mm, so then yeah. they may have a harder time training. You know, so a lot of times they uh, they trip over their own feet, you know, do, yeah. doing some of the things they do. But, yeah, definitely, definitely be careful of that. Yep. All right. Uh, so take your time. Build up a relationship. Peel away the onion the layer onion. in the dog's mind. Gotta get to that's that not onion. that's not typed in the notes, but by the way, <laughs> it's not? he just he just brings Let's it up. Peel it away. Yeah. The onion layer is a big deal. <laughs> then it's like Shrek. Add some layers. <laughs> hey, you peel away some layers. You add some layers. Hey. Layer on the remote collar work clearly and effectively and efficiently on your training foundation. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, good remote stuff. collars, good to go. You yeah. guys got anything to wrap it up? Good. That was good stuff. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin, you look like you got to say something. No. So, it's a great tool. <laughs> that look good to today. use, you know. Yep. You, you educate yourself on it like you would anything else before, uh, you know, making a harsh judgment. You know, to some people, when they see it out in public, uh, they just don't know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, yeah. it is a very – sometimes it's an emotional reaction mm-hmm. because they don't understand how it works. So I always like to take the time try to explain to them. Some people ain't hearing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people ain't hearing it. But, but it is an effective tool uh, no matter where you where you stand on the side of the fence there. So. Yep. And if you get to advanced levels of remote collar work and you're doing specialty training with it, I mean, it's incredible yeah. how clearly communication can be, how the dog responds to it. But you also have to be on your A game because mm-hmm. you're still operating in an operant world. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Reinforcing behavior, correcting behavior, using all the tools in your tube, tool belt. And the remote collar is just one tool. Yeah. One tool. Don't forget that. It's one tool. You know what I'm saying? So you got to use all the tools in your tool belt, you know, to effectively communicate with the dog and work them through different things. Can't build it off hot dogs alone, boys. That's right. <laughs> Peel away the onion layers. Good to go. <laughs> all right, guys. We appreciate you all listening to Canine Revolution Radio. Hey, if you got questions that you want us to address in podcasts, put it in the comments. <laughs> if you guys have any feedback, let us know. If you like the podcast, go ahead, uh, review us on your podcasting <coughs> platform so we know you know, the feedback, you know, hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Obviously like our Facebook page, obviously follow us on Instagram. Obviously. 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 Of course. On the IG boys. Have y'all seen the, uh, movie, the platform on Netflix? No. No. I told you guys to watch it. Well, Ben, did, did you watch it? Did you watch, watch the, the movie I told you to watch what with was? Mark Wahlberg? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm behind an episode on The Mandalorian right now. <laughs> what? So. What? I know, I know. Uh, right, we got to stop doing, this why podcast work? right now. Why are you at work? Get <laughs> out of here. Mandalorian. You know that's priority one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Y'all have a good one. See y'all next time.